den anerkendte professor i sociologi, Louis Wakang, holdt den 30. maj foredrag på SCV. Wakang var i Danmark i forbindelse med oversættelsen af hans bog, Urban Outcasts. Her fortæller Wakang om, hvorfor han ikke mener, der findes ghettoer i Danmark. Han bruger i stedet begrebet anti-ghettoer. Uh, I, I coined the concept of anti-ghettos to point out the fact that the poor neighborhoods where there are lots of migrants uh, throughout Western Europe are actually evolving away from the pattern of the ghetto. A ghetto is an area that is ethnically homogeneous, that concentrates more and more members of a particular group, and that, that allows this group to build its own institutions and to live a parallel life. And that typically has a boundary that is not porous, that can, it contains all the members of that particular group. And what we observe uh, throughout Western Europe is that those areas that are oftentimes designated as ghettos are in fact becoming more and more ethnically heterogeneous, not ethnically homogeneous. That uh, post-colonial migrants are becoming more dispersed throughout the national territory. It's the case here in Denmark, but it's the case uh, in Sweden or in France or in, in Germany or in, or in the Netherlands that these areas are being emptied of their parallel institutions, rather they're building uh, parallel institutions, and that their boundaries are porous, uh, meaning that as soon as the families who live in these neighborhoods improve, in particular, their income or their occupational status, they typically leave those areas. And so in all, uh, all of these dimensions, these areas are moving not closer to the pattern of the ghetto, they're moving away from the pattern of the ghetto, thus I call them anti-ghetto, uh, to, to signal the, how wrong the public debate is about these particular areas. Regeringens ghetto-liste får også en hård medfart af Vakang. Han mener, at selve begrebet ghetto ganske enkelt bliver brugt forkert af både politikere og medier. Uh, I think this list is not just problematic, I think it's idiotic. Uh, there is no purpose uh, served by labeling an area that is not a ghetto, a ghetto. The, on, the only effect of that is to stigmatize that area, to designate as an area that is the source of the problem rather than the repository of problems whose sources may be outside of these particular neighborhoods. Uh, these neighborhoods typically are, are declining, um, dispossessed areas uh, that suffer from either the degradation of housing, Uh, or a situation of high unemployment or precarious employment, uh, or sometimes a situation of uh, street crime, uh, then what we should do is call them by the proper name that corresponds to the reality of this neighborhood. If it's a problem of housing, then call them areas of dilapidated housing, and then the policy then is housing improvement. If it's an area of high employment, then call them an area of high employment and then obviously the policy should be the remedy should be to provide jobs or to provide income as a remedy for those who can't uh, access the the employment market if it's an area that has a lot of crime then call it a high crime area but don't uh, use this very ambiguous term of ghetto which seems to create a link between ethnicity or immigrant status and crime, and housing degradation, and unemployment, seemingly making the residents of the area responsible for the conditions under which they live. When, for instance, when you are unemployed, in general, the, the reason is that they're, because there's no employment that you could take, uh, or that you weren't able to develop the qualification, then in which case, then you need a, a, a skills uh, im- improvement policy, you need a job creation policy. Um, The, the, the use of the, uh, the notion of ghetto has served essentially as an instrument to tarnish these places and it participates in the stigmatization of these areas and the populations uh, that live in these, uh, in these district. And I would call many of these areas um, impoverished, stigmatized areas and part of the stigma comes from the discourse of the ghetto. So if, if at least we can remove the discourse of stigmatization, then we have begun to solve the problem. Var Karen afslutter interviewet med at fortælle om, hvordan han mener, at de danske politikere bør føre politik? I think um, the, the solution has to follow from the diagnosis. And this is where if you, lose, if you use the term ghetto, you are misdiagnosing these areas. And therefore you cannot come up with the right solution. We know this from the experience of France which in the 1990s passed many anti-ghetto laws and still continues to have areas of intense uh, poverty and, and urban dereliction at its urban periphery. Because the problem is one of, in particular, high unemployment and high insecure employment. And so I think that if you, 
if you if you define if you break the problem down into its constituent parts, then you can designate a housing policy for those areas where there's a problem of housing quality. Then you can designate a, a crime prevention policy for those areas where there's a high rate of uh, street delinquency. Then you can have a jobs creation policy for those areas that suffer from 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 high joblessness. You can uh, you can begin to have realistic policies that address the components of the problem rather than sort of lump them all together under a particular category of the ghetto that is uh, improper to capture the reality of these areas. And so uh, one, if I had to, if you said, what if you were minister of the city in Denmark, uh, what would you do? Um, I, would, I would do uh, three things immediately. I would ensure that the public services in those dilapidated areas are as good as the public services that are provided in the best neighborhoods of the city, first. Uh, second, I would um, uh, have a policy that would bring full employment. Uh, and then, I, my bet is that if you did these two things, these areas would, would stop being a problem. Because essentially the problem of unemployment or precarious employment uh, and the problem of housing uh, and access to quality public services, including in particular the school, the quality of the school is very important. And I think when you look at the delivery of public services in this forzomt area, I think the important thing is they have, the quality has to be on a par with the need. Uh, and oftentimes the need is greater, therefore the quality has to be higher. And so uh, in, I, I am an advocate of, of, of affirmative action in the quality of public services for those areas that need it the most, so that uh, the quality of schools, the quality of public transportation, the quality of health services, the quality of social services should be uh, at least as high, as good, if not better, than the quality of those same services in the average neighborhood of Copenhagen or matching the quality in the best neighborhoods of Copenhagen. And I think the problem will, will be on its way to being solved. I think when, when Danish politicians, like politicians in Sweden or in England or in France, uh, invoke the term ghetto, they, it's a veiled way of designating a particular population, the Muslims. It's a veiled way of invoking a racist or an ethno-religious invidious distinctions that are not palatable if you say them outright. And so you use the euphemism of the ghetto and everybody understands who you mean. And I think it's a very dangerous game for game for politicians to play. This is the game, of course, that was played in Europe in the 1930s, and we know uh, the, with the result of the coming of the fascist regimes uh, what the result was. So I would, I would warn, as a citizen of Europe, uh, the politicians of Denmark, as the politicians of my own country, France, uh, to be very careful. When they, when they play with words, they can be playing with fire, and you don't want to be setting the city on fire.